this episode, we present the evidence which was provided by Sheila's psychiatrist, Dr Hugh Cameron Ferguson, in his witness statements and at the trial. Dr Ferguson was a consultant psychiatrist at St Andrew's Hospital, Northampton, and had been qualified since 1959. In late 1982, he treated June Bamba, who was suffering from psychosis and had distorted religious beliefs. He first saw Sheila in his Harley Street clinic on the 2nd of August 1983, following a request to Sheila's GP by Neville and June Bamba. On the 4th of August 1983, Dr Ferguson admitted Sheila to St Andrews for treatment and he stated that she responded well to treatment and Ferguson quickly diagnosed Sheila as having schizophrenia and also she suffered from periods of acute psychosis and that the onset of her condition had begun in her early 20s. In his evidence, he set out how Sheila's condition affected how she viewed the world, herself, friends, family and in particular her young twin sons, Nicholas and Daniel. He offered an opinion in his discharge letter that there was also a measure of her doing violence to her children and that she had a great deal of morbid thoughts which he concluded were abnormal, frightening, disturbed and in a sense irrational. Sheila was admitted to St Andrews a second time on the 3rd of March 1985, again under the care of Dr Ferguson. Following a severe psychotic episode, she remained in hospital for almost four weeks and was discharged on the 29th of March 1985. Dr Ferguson was to arrange outpatient appointments and for a community psychiatric nurse to see her on a regular basis but there's no evidence that this ever happened. However, Sheila's GP was asked to administer her antipsychotic medication by injection so that Sheila could not avoid taking it. Nevertheless, four weeks prior to the tragedies at White House Farm, her fortnightly injection of 200 mg of haloperidol was reduced in error to 100 mg each month. As a result, by the time of the 7th of August 1985, Sheila was severely under-medicated and only had a trace of antipsychotic medication in her system. Dr Ferguson was not called by the prosecution to give evidence at Jeremy Bamber's trial. However, the defence did summon him and because of this, the questions he was asked could only be based on his statements. Defence records record when he was contacted with the trial date, he was more than a little put out to say the least, and was extremely distressed at the thought of not being able to go on holiday. Dr. Ferguson became a medical director of St. Andrew's Hospital in 1991 and continued in full time practice as both a psychiatrist and medical director until December 1995, when he retired. Dr Ferguson continued to work part-time as a consultant at St Andrews and was still in practice in 2002. As in the case of Paul Paget Lewis, which features in another podcast episode, the evidence indicates that Dr Ferguson was also negligent in his care and support of Sheila Caffell. Had he monitored her medication correctly, and had he arranged the support of a community nurse, and if he had seen her at outpatient's appointments, he may well have noticed that Sheila was once again spiralling into a psychotic episode which had ultimately disastrous results. Constant, professional monitoring of Sheila would have prevented her from arriving at the farmhouse with her sons where there was an arsenal of guns waiting to be used by a frightened and distressed young woman in desperate need of proper medical care and support. Dr Hugh Cameron Ferguson, 54 years old, statement 8th of August 1985. 
I work as a consultant psychiatrist at St Andrew's Hospital, Billing Road, Northampton, and at 14 Devonshire Place, London, where I have consultations with our patients. I first saw Sheila Caffell in Harley Street on the 2nd of August 1983. She had been referred for psychiatric treatment by her GP, Dr Angeloglu, and I understand the GP had already made an appointment for her to be seen in the psychiatric outpatients clinic at the Royal Free Hospital in London later in August 1983, but Sheila's parents had requested that she be referred to me for treatment as I had previously treated her mother. In fact, when I refer to Sheila's parents, I mean her adopted parents, Mr Neville Bamber and Mrs June Bamber, who live in Essex. I treated Mrs June Bamber in late 1982 for a mental illness which was a psychosis, as a result of which she suffered a distortion of her already strong religious beliefs and tended to see everything in terms of good and evil. Mrs. Bamber's condition improved as a result of the treatment, although she still maintained her religious belief. When I first saw Sheila Caffell, I diagnosed that she was in a state of acute psychosis and had been so for about two weeks. It was evident that she had been depressed and unconfident for the previous 18 months and had an increasing sensitivity about other people. The history of her case was of a slow onset, leading to an acute breakdown, inferring a poor outlook. I arranged for Sheila to be admitted to St Andrew's Hospital, Northampton, on the 4th of August, 1983. During her treatment, I found that Sheila had bizarre delusions about possession by the devil and complex ideas about having sex with her twin sons. She thought her sons would seduce her and saw evil in both of them. In particular, she thought her son Nicholas was becoming a woman-hater and was a potential murderer. She said she felt as if she was caught up in a coven of evil. These feelings appeared to be involved with her relationship with her adoptive mother and her standards of good and evil. These feelings, she expressed, were clear symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. Sheila did not give any impression that she was violent or potentially violent. She was bewildered. She did see that Mrs. Bamber was a threat to her and did not want to visit the Bambers at their farm in Essex. Sheila felt that Mrs. Bamber had been overprotective towards her and found it difficult to express warm feelings towards her. Her relationship with Mr. Bamber appeared to be more trusting and supportive. Sheila had a relationship with a man called Freddy. I do not know how involved the relationship was, but I believe he babysat for her. She had friends where she lived in London, and these friends appeared to offer some support. It did seem that she tried to live independently from her parents, but I doubt whether she was financially independent. Sheila was aware that she had been adopted since the age of eight weeks old. In 1982... She wanted to discover her natural mother and did so through an agency. She did not appear to have been keen to trace her natural father. I understand Sheila met her natural mother in the summer of 1985 when her mother visited this country from Canada. Whilst at this hospital, Sheila responded to treatment and was discharged on the 10th of September 1983. I would describe her condition at the time of her discharge as having made a partial recovery. She was not deluded or hallucinating. She was discharged to go home with the Bambers for a few weeks before returning to live in London. I arranged to see her later as an outpatient, although I did recommend any further treatment should be conducted through the NHS, as I was concerned about the cost of private treatment being borne by Mr Bamber. I continued to see Sheila as an outpatient throughout 1984, she managed to maintain normal relationships with her family. She was still vulnerable to unsettled feelings, but as these arose, they were dealt with. This was a residual stage of her treatment. She was at that time prescribed a low-dose antipsychotic drug. Sheila was fairly erratic in attendance for appointments, and I also believe in taking her medicine. She and her family rejected the suggestion of treatment under the NHS. 
In March 1985, Sheila was readmitted to St Andrew's Hospital on the 3rd of March 1985. I had last seen her in December 1984. At that time, she was settled and about to start work in a shop. The circumstances of the readmission were that Mr Neville Bamber phoned the hospital, requesting that she be readmitted urgently due to deterioration in her mental state. Sheila was found to be psychotic, and this time she thought that her boyfriend Freddy was the devil. She made no reference to her parents or her children. Her behaviour was more disconnected than before. She laughed inappropriately and was restless. She said she had some religious feelings. She had found God and felt relaxed. During her time at the hospital, Sheila admitted she had used cocaine fairly frequently this year. She did not go into depth about drug abuse, except that she said she had smoked the cocaine in a social context. She denied using hallucinogenic drugs or amphetamine. Her psychotic condition was not drug-induced, but would certainly be exacerbated by abuse of illicit drugs. I was not aware that Sheila abused alcohol at all. Again, Sheila responded to treatment as an outpatient and was discharged on the 29th of March 1985. I later corresponded with Dr Angeloglu and recommended follow-up treatment by the NHS in London and that a long-term case management should include visits from a community psychiatric nurse. 30th of September 1985, statement taken by the defence. Further to my previous statements, I have been asked to clarify certain matters and to comment upon the various matters referred to below. When Sheila was readmitted to St Andrews on the 3rd of March 1985, she had relapsed into an acute psychotic state with very bizarre religious and paranoid delusional ideas. During her stay, she was obviously excited at the prospect of meeting her natural mother for the first time, and was anxious not only to be well, but to be seen to be well enough to leave hospital so as to avoid having to meet her mother whilst a patient. During this stay at the hospital, in contrast to her first admission, she had been unsettled and reluctant to remain and to accept the need for help. Her delusional ideas on admission included her boyfriend, Freddy, being the devil. There was a very religious basis to her delusional thinking. Her psychotic symptoms proceeded briefly on medication, but when this was reduced, she again flared up into paranoid interpretations of the nursing staff, becoming at times quite hostile, and believing that she was being monitored and televised, and that there was an attempt by the devil to take away her godliness, with many people around her being seen to be involved in the conspiracy. Latterly, she claimed to have lost her delusional ideas. She rationalised her earlier feelings about Freddy being the devil as he being instead dangerous to her as a bad influence and as the source of the cocaine used by her. As I have stated previously, I was concerned about her leaving hospital as soon as she did and I was particularly anxious that there should be psychiatric outpatient follow-up within the NHS nearer her Maida Vale home. She was, when she left, and was likely to remain, very vulnerable. Her condition needed monitoring, and she needed support. I understand at the time of her death, she was about to be referred to St Mary's Hospital, London. I have been shown an extract from the statement of her boyfriend, Freddy, in which he describes her violent conduct immediately preceding her admission on the 3rd of March, 1985. I had no knowledge of her using physical violence at any time, but someone in her condition faced with what she regarded as real pressing fears could respond with physical aggression directed to property, to herself or to others. There is no reason to doubt what Freddy says. I have been shown and have read the statement made by Helen Grimster, in which Sheila is described on the 30th of March as having been very strange, talking of having contemplated suicide on more than one occasion, and of her belief that she was a white witch and had to get rid of evil in the world. Whilst I have no knowledge of this conversation other than what I have read, 
I would regard these abnormalities as consistent with the condition from which she suffered. I have been told that Sheila described herself at times as suffering from a Madonna complex. That was not an expression she used to me, and I cannot say what she meant by it. I have referred in my previous statement to Sheila's use of cannabis and cocaine. Whilst these drugs themselves would not have any effect upon the medication prescribed, I was concerned about her using them and advised her strongly not to. Such drugs can alter the perception of the user chemically, producing disturbed perceptions. In the case of a schizophrenic patient, such drugs can potentially aggravate the existing psychosis. I have been asked to express an opinion as to how she might have reacted if she became aware of a proposal to remove the children from her care. I would expect a very negative reaction. She would resist in any way she knew. It would threaten whatever precarious balances she had. Her precise responses would be difficult to predict. She could have withdrawn into depression or become angry and vitriolic. I have been asked to comment upon the report that Sheila was said on the 6th of August 1985 to have had no interest in anything including the twins. Her attitude towards the twins had always appeared to me to be caring and there was no evident lack of feeling. A possible side effect of the haloperidol is a general deadening of feeling and interest. I am told that the last injection of Haldol was on the 11th of July 1985 when she received half the previous dosage. If such lack of interest or feeling had not shown itself earlier, it is less likely to be a side effect of the drug bearing in mind the reduction of dosage and the fact that some four weeks had elapsed since her last injection. If that feeling was not attributable to the drug, one would therefore have to interpret her lack of interest in her children as part of her general and disturbed mental state. I have been asked to comment upon the significance of her meeting with her natural mother after her discharge from the hospital. It was obviously an important event, a positive, good event in her life, but the parting may have been difficult. It is impossible to assess the effect of that occurrence. It may or may not have been an unsettling occurrence for one in her condition. There is no indication in my case notes of any hostility between Sheila and her brother Jeremy. Whilst in 1983 she expressed fears of harming or doing violence to her children, that fear did not seem to recur. I find it difficult to conceptualise her harming her children or her father, but I could conceive of her harming her mother or herself. Of course, I cannot state categorically that she was incapable of doing harm to her family. I last saw Sheila on the 29th of March 1985, although I spoke to her on the telephone sometime in April. It has been explained to me that this statement and my previous three statements made to the police may be read to the court. I am content that, taken together, the statements reflect accurately my opinions. Trial Transcript, October 1985. Examination by Mr. Geoffrey Rivling, QC. And do you remember referring to her morbid thoughts in a letter to Dr. Angeloglu on the 23rd of September? Uh, I'm sorry, could you please... Do you recall referring to her morbid thoughts, or some of them, in a letter to Dr. Angeloglu dated 23rd of September 1983? Yes, yes, I do. What were the morbid thoughts that she experienced and to which you made specific reference? I made mention of her unease about her reactions to the twins and her twins to her, and, as I mentioned before, a feeling of evil with which the boys would respond to which the boys would respond, and that she was capable of murdering them or communicating some ability for them to become evil or murderers at a later date is the term I used. I then made some mention, although it was elaborated more fully in the discharge letter, about the other thoughts uh, about other people and indeed the whole world around about her being a frightening place. 
Dealing with thoughts about other people. Any people in particular that she had apparently strong thoughts about? She had a very strong belief that she had evil in her mind and that her mother also had, uh, her adoptive mother, also had evil in her mind and that both would need this evil to be cleansed. Extract from Dr Ferguson's 2002 statement to the defence. I have been asked about the evidence I gave at Mr Bamber's trial, and I can say as far as it goes, I stand by today what I said in response to questioning from all sides of the court. However, I have been asked specifically to address three matters which I was unaware of at the time. Firstly, my attention has been drawn to Psalms 51, appearing in the Bible, pages 656 and 657, apparently found open next to Sheila Caffell's body. I can say I was wholly unaware of the existence of these pages at the time I gave evidence. Having read the passages, I can say that in my view they contain in them the themes which over time I knew were exercising Sheila Caffell. In short form, the struggle between good and evil, or God and the devil. Secondly, my attention has been drawn to the fact of an inscription on a cupboard in the twins room which bears the legend, I hate this place. Assuming Sheila Caffell wrote this inscription, it would not have surprised me, firstly because of her immaturity, which I had observed, and secondly that I formed the impression that she was not always comfortable when staying at the farmhouse. Thirdly, I have been asked to consider a letter written by Colin Caffell, estranged husband of Sheila, at a time, as it appeared, when Sheila had been discharged from my care in March 1985. I can confirm that at the time of the trial I was wholly unaware of this letter or its contents. Having read this letter, I am confident that had anyone chosen to question me in relation to its contents at trial, I would certainly have added to my evidence. Colin's letter to Neville Bamber Dear Neville, I am pleased to hear that Sheila is now out of hospital. This whole episode has been a great worry for me, as I am sure it has been for you. I am writing to you specifically because I haven't seen you during this time, and there are some thoughts and fears that I would like to put to you directly. As you are probably already aware, my main concern is for the health, safety and stability of the two boys and everything that is a threat I will stand fast to protect them from. I am sure you will agree that their welfare comes before anything else. I have been called aside a couple of times in the last term by their teacher, who has expressed serious concerns for their progress and welfare. They have been dropping far behind the rest of the class, their behaviour has been erratic and moody, and they have lacked self-motivation, which is most unusual in two so bright. She was also worried that their frequent and acute lateness was causing them to miss out a lot, through missing the beginning of the day. I was unaware of this until recently, when my mother informed me that the boys have told her that on most days they had to dress themselves and fetch their own breakfast and then attempt to wake mummy to take them to school. This sort of thing should not be happening to five-year-olds. In a private meeting with Miss Fisher, the headmistress, about a week after the breakdown, these fears were expressed more strongly. However, she was greatly relieved to hear that the boys were now living with me and hoped that this would continue. For some time she had been extremely worried about their stability and that of their home life. Happily, since being with me, they have settled down at school and have now become leaders in the classroom rather than falling rapidly behind. The boys have often complained to me and my parents that mummy never listens to them or even hears what they are saying or answers their questions. We all know that Sheila lives in her own little world and is almost oblivious to anything but her own thoughts. She has been like that for a long time and the boys are now obviously finding this very distressing. They are also very disillusioned about religion and put off by it since all this happened. They have been most upset and have complained to me that Granny forces them to say prayers at every opportunity she has alone with them. The combination of this and witnessing their mother's religious illusions has been most traumatic for them, to say the least. Therefore, I must insist that you ask or tell Mrs Bamber to refrain from forcing any religion on the boys in any way. If she cannot agree to this, 
I will have no choice but to restrict the amount of time she spends with them unsupervised. I will not allow her to fuck up the minds of my children in the way I suspect she has your daughter. I am sorry to be so blunt, but that is restrained compared to how I really feel. As I said before, my main concern is the welfare of the children, and I would be most grateful for your help in this matter. I would like you to help me to try and convince Sheila that it would be better for her and the boys if they stayed with me most of the time and she saw them whenever she wished. Please realise that I don't wish to take them away from her. That would be no good for anyone. However, I do wish to have full control over their well-being. 4 Buttermere, Augustus Street, London, NW1 I think it would be beneficial for us to get together for a chat in the near future, just the two of us. Perhaps you could ring me at my father's or leave a message with him if I'm not there. The number is 01387 5435. I look forward to hearing from you soon. My very best regards, Colin. Dr Ferguson, 2002 Statement, Continued I was unaware, namely of the possibility, that Colin Caffell could take over the full-time care for the children from Sheila, and that he potentially sought to achieve this with the assistance of Neville Bamba. This information, in my view, may have significance. As I pointed out in evidence, I formed the view that Neville Bamba was seen by Sheila Caffell as a very secure, caring and strong support, in that I had recorded at the time that she saw him as a mentor. On the hypothesis that Neville Bamba had pleaded Colin Caffell's case, I would have been of the view at the time and now that this could have had a potentially catastrophic effect on Sheila Caffell and affected her from two points of view. Firstly, from the point of view of her having her children removed from her care, and from the second point of view, that she may have projected onto her father a concept of evil in which he had hitherto not been involved in her thought process. Mm -hmm.